One of the fundamental things that we try to accomplish with managerial accounting is to figure out what something costs. Now that cost object could be an activity, could be a product, could be a service. Think about a building that's being constructed. The construction company certainly is going to want to know how much it costs to build that building. They want to know if they determine uh, if they made a profit and when they build other buildings in the future they're also going to want to know what those historical costs were so they can figure out how to price future construction projects. Think about a law firm. They would want to know how much did it cost us to defend this particular client. Or a CPA firm. What was the cost of completing the audit for a client? Even Grand Valley State University might wonder what is the cost of producing this video right here or a particular section of a course. Maybe the course that you're taking right now. So we have cost objects. Those are the targets for these costs. The cost object is the thing that we are trying to figure out what it costs. Now, in order to do that, we really need to think about something called cost drivers. But before we get too deep into cost drivers, let's talk about three major categories of costs. And those are uh, direct materials, direct labor, and then in a minute we'll see manufacturing overhead. So, uh, direct materials and direct labor, we would typically consider those to be traceable costs. So a traceable cost is something that can be conveniently or easily traced to a specific job a, or a specific cost object really. So if we are a construction company and we use some um, lumber on job number one, job number two, and on job number three, it's fairly easy to figure out the cost of the lumber that was traced to any one of those particular jobs. Direct labor is not any more challenging because we have time records, probably a time sheet or an electronic time record, and as people work on those jobs, they can decide uh, what number of hours they work on a job and they can tell the accounting department how many hours to allocate to a particular job. So. Tracing costs, uh, we're going to do that whenever possible. That is going to be the most accurate way of assigning costs to a cost object. The difficulty comes with this, with manufacturing overhead. So with manufacturing overhead, it's not easy, it's not convenient to trace those costs to a particular cost object. And so what we end up doing with manufacturing overhead is something called allocation. It's a calculation. It's a mathematical averaging where we take a bucket of overhead costs, and we're going to look in a minute at some examples of what overhead could be. And we're going to take this bucket of overhead costs and we spread it out among the various cost objects. In this case, the jobs that we have going on at a particular period of time. Again, allocation is a compromise because we would prefer to trace costs to cost objects, but in this case, it might not be easy, convenient. It simply might not be cost effective to do so. So some examples of manufacturing overhead, and this really is a very abbreviated list, but it's just used to illustrate some types of costs that are subject to allocation in most cases. Depreciation on equipment. Uh, if you think about a particular, let's say, front end loader on a construction job. That front end loader might work for 40 or 80 or 120 hours on a particular job and then it might be deployed to a different job. So not really easy to trace the cost of that equipment to a particular job. Instead we have to settle for allocation. Utility costs like electricity, gas, water in a manufacturing facility, probably difficult to trace those to a particular job. And the same thing could be true for lots of general overhead costs like property taxes or insurance premiums, things like that. Now, before we get into some math that I know you guys are dying to calculate, uh, let's talk about a little bit more terminology. There are prime costs, direct materials and direct labor are those prime costs, and then conversion costs. The way I like to think about it is this. The conversion costs measure the cost of things that we use to convert direct materials into finished goods. So in other words, if we apply direct labor and manufacturing overhead to convert direct materials to finished goods, that's why they're called conversion costs. Whereas the prime costs are really the two building blocks for our cost object. And you'll also notice that the prime costs, direct materials, direct labor, are typically traced to cost objects. 
whereas the manufacturing overhead is forced to be allocated to particular objects. Now, if we're going to do this allocation, and that's where we're heading next, is to figure out how to allocate some costs, we need to choose a cost driver. Think about the term, driver. So a cost driver is anything that causes costs to change, to increase or decrease. Could be machine hours, could be how many things we produce, could be labor hours, could be the miles that you drive in a car. If you think about the cost of putting fuel in your car, if you drive more miles, your total fuel cost will increase. So miles driven is a terrific cost driver if you're trying to describe and measure how much gas you're going to have to purchase for a particular period of time. So when we think about the cost driver, we want to make sure that there is not only correlation, but also causation. Uh, the cost of fuel in your car is very highly correlated with the number of miles driven. And there is a causal relationship. More miles equals more gasoline. Now, sometimes there might be a correlation, but there really is not a cost. Or, I mean, there really is not a cause, excuse me, to driving that cost. And that would be an example of a poor cost driver. Take this, this cartoon, for example. I don't know if that's Billy or Jeffy, I can't remember, but he's on the airplane. I wish they didn't turn on that seatbelt sign so much. Every time they do, it gets bumpy. Well, yes, there's a correlation. When the seatbelt sign is on, it's bumpy. But probably the bumps cause the sign to be on, not vice versa. Another one here. Divorces in Maine, highly correlated with the consumption of margarine in the United States. Interesting, little trivial, probably no causation there, okay? So we have to make sure that the cost driver does a good job of explaining how costs change. So once we've chosen an appropriate cost driver, what we can do is we can calculate this thing called a predetermined overhead rate. And the predetermined overhead rate allows us to assign costs to cost objects in a very real-time manner as jobs and as things get completed throughout a particular time period. Now, take a look at the formula. What we have here is estimated total manufacturing cost, right there, over estimated total activity or total units in the allocation base for the coming period. So this is a predictive measure. Okay? This predetermined overhead rate, and think about the word predetermined, this is being determined before production ever begins, before activity even begins. So it's an estimate. And we know that managerial accounting is a trade-off. Sometimes we trade accuracy for relevance or for timeliness, and that's a little bit of what we see right here. We are not going to be perfectly accurate. We're not going to be perfectly correct. We don't have a crystal ball. However, we need some information to make decisions, and we are willing to sacrifice a little bit of that accuracy in order to have timely, relevant information as we assign costs to cost objects. So this is estimated overhead cost in total over estimated activity for the coming period. So let's calculate that predetermined overhead rate. Now, just as a reminder, a predetermined overhead rate is being determined before production begins. It's predetermined. And let's look at the facts here. A little bit of a story problem. We estimate that it will require 160,000 direct labor hours during the coming period, okay? So what I'm seeing is a hint toward a variable cost, potentially, okay? Then there's also an estimate total fixed manufacturing overhead at $200,000, okay? So what we need to do is we need to figure out what is the total cost. Now, there was that hint of variable cost, and we do see a rate here, $2.75 per direct labor hour. So let's figure out our total variable costs, and that's simply going to be the rate per direct labor hour, so $2.75 per direct labor hour, multiplied by our estimate of how many direct labor hours we will incur during the coming period, and we come up with, did the math beforehand, I'm sure you guys can follow along nicely with a calculator in the background. Check me, let me know if I made a mistake. I am human. 
But what we're doing is we're saying we think the total estimated t variable cost only is 440000 Now, total overhead, total manufacturing overhead, is going to be the combination of total variable costs, just coming from right there, and the total anticipated fixed costs, which was given to us over here. Okay, just pulling that together. So total estimated overhead for the period is $640,000. Let's stop and remind ourselves what this represents. This is a bucket of costs that cannot be conveniently or easily traced to cost objects. Instead, we're going to have to settle for allocation, and we need to have some method of allocation, and that's going to be our predetermined overhead rate. So now we have the building blocks to calculate this predetermined overhead rate. As a reminder, the formula is simply going to be estimated total overhead for the upcoming period, which is our numerator, divided by the estimated activity in our allocation base or our cost driver. So we plan on $640,000 total manufacturing overhead in the coming period. And we think that we're going to have workers who work a total of 160,000 direct labor hours. That boils us down to $4 per direct labor hour. Every time a worker works on a job for one hour, we're going to allocate $4 of overhead to that particular job. Now, when we get to the end of the year, our total overhead that's been allocated to jobs probably, almost certainly, will not equal the $640,000, but hopefully it's close, and hopefully we were able to make better decisions by having some immediate way of allocating costs to jobs in a real-time fashion. So let's look at a form of allocation now. Now, indirect materials is a form of manufacturing overhead. This $60,000 that we see right here, these are materials that would not be easy or convenient to trace to a particular chair or a particular desk. It just wouldn't make sense. It would not be worth our time. Think about things like screws or adhesives like glues that could be used in the production of chairs and desks. Uh, probably not worth our time to count out the number of screws and determine how many are used in a particular chair or how many ounces of glue are used. So instead, we, we settle for the trade-off, which is allocation. So what we have here, we've got $60,000 that we want to allocate, and we have 5,000 products, okay, 5,000 units of product overall that we intend to, uh, intend to produce. That's this 5,000 right here, 4,000 chairs, 1,000 uh, desks, for a total of 5,000. So basically, the indirect materials cost is averaged out as $12 per unit. And if we make 4,000 shares, nothing really complicated with the math here. Um, it's just kind of understanding the procedures. So we take that average of $12 per chair times 4,000 shares. That means that we're going to allocate $48,000 of indirect materials to all of the chairs that we make. And we plan to make 1,000 tables. If we actually make those 1,000 tables, again, at a unit cost of $12 per unit, so $12 per table, that's 12,000 bucks. As you can see, what we've successfully done here is we've alloc we split up the total indirect materials of 60,000 and we put those into the two buckets of tables and chairs. And then also, as we're configuring, the, figuring out the uh, final product cost here, if you wanted to figure out what was the total cost of producing 4,000 chairs, well, it's certainly going to be the direct materials that we can trace to the cost object, which is chairs, plus the allocated indirect materials. So the total cost of making these chairs is $548,000. When we get over here to the desks, we add the $12,000 of indirect labor, and then the total cost of making 1,000 desks is $1,012,000. That's just one way of allocating an overhead amount. 
we're going to take a look at another method in just a second. So in the previous calculation, we used units of production as our cost driver. But what if that's not the best uh, predictor of how costs change with activity? Let's look at an alternative. We may decide that direct labor hours is a better predictor of um, how costs behave. So we take the same $60,000 that we were dealing with, but now instead of figuring out the average indirect materials per unit of production, let's figure out the average indirect materials per direct labor hour. We anticipate 6,000 total direct labor hours, which we're just grabbing from over here, 2,500 for the uh, chairs, 3,500 for the desks, we come up with an average rate of $10 per direct labor hour. Now, the chairs are going to use 2,500 direct labor hours. Just taking that from right here, $2,500 uh, 2, direct labor hours times this predetermined rate of $10 per direct labor hour gives us a nice round number of $25,000. And then the, the desks actually um, look like they're pretty labor intensive, 3,500 direct labor hours. Uh, and think about this too, we're making 4,000 chairs and incurring 2,500 direct labor hours. We're making only 1,000 desks but using more direct labor hours. So these desks are definitely more labor intensive than the chairs. Now whether or not direct labor is a good predictor of how the indirect materials um, change, that, that's uh, debatable. And we, would, we would have to make that determination. But what we do know is that labor hours are being consumed at a greater rate by the desks. So what you see here is this $60,000 that we're allocating is being split up a little bit differently. And now we only have $25,000 being allocated to the chairs, whereas we have uh, $35,000 being allocated to the desks. If you remember, and if you kind of rewind the video, previously we had $48,000 going to chairs and $12,000 going to desks. So using a different allocation base can have dramatically different results. That's why it's really important to make sure that whatever allocation base you're choosing is a cost driver that predicts how costs will behave.